A few years ago when I was a teenager, God in his mercy led me to a Pentecostal church where I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, was baptized in Jesus' name. And I'm so thankful for that because I was brought up in a church that claimed to be the original church, but was not the original church. And God in his mercy led me to the original church that Jesus Christ started and has been building now for 2,000 years. I don't believe that we're a part of something that died out for hundreds of years and then all of a sudden came back to life in the early 20th century. I believe we're a part of something that's been around now for 2,000 years. And I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation of them that believe. And I'm not ashamed to be Pentecostal. I'm not ashamed to speak in tongues. I'm not ashamed that I've been baptized in the only saving name, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I consider it, I still consider it a distinct privilege and an honor that God has led me into this. And what a wonderful thing we've become a part of. And we, uh, <laughs> I don't know where, where they got this idea. They used to think, well, Pentecost from the wrong side of the tracks and stuff like that. I was on the wrong side of the tracks, and God brought me on the right side of the tracks. <laughs> and brought me into this kingdom that Jesus Christ is building. I believe it's the best thing that there is on the face of this earth to be a part of. And we need to thank God every day of our lives. We don't need to look for fault in the church. We don't need to look for a reason to leave the church because all that's outside of the church is the beggarly elements of this world. I don't want to go back to that. I don't want to be go back to the vomit like the dog does. I don't want to go back to that life that the Lord delivered me from, but I want to stick with the church of the living God, and find help in the time of need. And so today we're going to look at the church through history. And we're going to start with Scripture here. And first of all, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 16 and verse uh, 15 we'll begin with. Jesus is kind of away from his main area of ministry outside of uh, Caesarea Philippi, and he's asking his disciples what people were saying about him. There was a lot of speculation back then about who Jesus was, just like there is today. And then he directed the question to them. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus responded by saying, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And he goes on to say, he says, I say also unto thee that thou art Peter. And upon this rock or this revelation that Peter had just received about who Jesus was, Jesus said, I will build my church. And the gates of hell or the gates of death shall not prevail against it. I believe what he's saying here is that he's going to build this church and that death is not going to prevail against the church that he is building. I believe a proper interpretation of this scripture is one that says ever since it began, there's been living, breathing people that have been a part of the church that Jesus Christ is building. We're not a part of something that, uh, it, it, you know, died out, but we're a part of something that's been going on now for a long time. And we are so blessed to be a part of it. And then he said to Peter, he said, I will give to thee the keys of of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Very beautiful, important verses of Scripture that talk about the primary purpose that God came to earth and robed himself in flesh, and that was to bring into being the church and then to build that church. And he's been continually building the church ever since it began 2,000 years ago. Then... We'll go to Luke chapter 24 and verse 46, and we'll see how that Jesus has been crucified, buried, now risen from the dead, and just before he ascends into heaven, he says to his disciples, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And then he goes on to say that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name. What was his name? Among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So the disciples returned back to Jerusalem, and they waited for the promise in the upper room in Jerusalem there. And on the day of Pentecost, they were all marvelously filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them the utterance. 
and people who had been cowering in fear of the authorities up till that point now with holy boldness spilled out in the streets of Jerusalem and acted very Pentecostal. And a great crowd gathered around because of the phenomena that was taking place there in Jerusalem back then on the day of Pentecost 2,000 years ago. And some of them remarked, these people look like they're drunk. But Peter, who had been given the keys in Matthew chapter 16, stood up in the midst of the crowd that day and said, these people aren't drunk. And then he began to preach a beautiful message. Some people think it was great because it was short, but uh, uh, very short to the point. Of course, the Bible says with many other words, did he? Anyway, uh, we're not timing him. But anyway, uh, <laughs> Peter had apparently had never read that book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, because right at the end of his message, he said, you're a bunch of murderers. You've crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's a lot of talk now about a new movie that just come out and uh, talking about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And some people were saying that Jews were going to get upset because it'll, uh, you know, inspire some more anti-Semitism and stuff like that. But uh, the reality is that we all are guilty of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It was for our sin that he died. Our sins really were the things that nailed him to the cross. And we all got to realize that we are guilty. And so fortunately for Peter, you know, they said that that there was a convicting presence of the Lord there that day. And they responded to this accusation of murder on their part. He said, well, what shall we do? How can we overcome the guilt of having crucified this innocent man? And then Peter, for the first time, reveals the keys that were entrusted to him in Matthew chapter 16. And in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, he says, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. This is good news, folks. (laughs) This isn't bad news. This is good news. (laughs) So my people say, do I have to get baptized? Do I have to receive something the angels would like to have? Do I have to do this, you know? It's kind of like somebody getting a check in the mail for a million dollars. Do I have to bring this to the bank? You know? And you get it to the bank, and the teller says, all you got to do is sign the back of the check, and we'll deposit this in your account. Do I have to sign the back of the check? We think that's ridiculous, don't we? I think it's more ridiculous to say, do I have to have my sins washed away in the watery grave of baptism? Do I have to receive that wonderful gift of the Holy Ghost. We're talking about something that if that Holy Ghost is dwelling within us, when the Lord returns, that same Spirit that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead will quicken your mortal bodies. One of these days the Lord is coming back. I want to be ready to meet the Lord in the air, don't you? I want to be a part of the church that Jesus Christ is building. I want to be born again according to the Scripture of water and of (laughs) spirits. Now, many people try to get around the necessity of baptism, and they go to the Greek. Do we have any Greek scholars here today besides your pastor? Oh, well, anyway. Uh, (laughs) They go to the Greek uh, word that's translated for here in Acts 2.3, and they said it means because of. They said, Peter said, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, because of the remission of sins. Now, when you interpret it that way, it sounds like that you're, Sins have already been remitted in repentance, doesn't it? But I've got a book, and the author of this book sent letters to Greek professors and universities all over this country asking them explicitly what the Greek word translated for here in Acts 2.38 means. And without exception, these authorities on the Greek language said it could not mean because of in the context that it's written. They said it either means unto or in order of. So it should leave us with little wonder why 3,000 people said, yeah, that sounds like a pretty good deal. I think I'd like to get baptized in Jesus' name because they recognized that it was unto the remission of sins. Oh, thank God for this beautiful, beautiful experience of baptism in Jesus' name and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Now, another thing that was very uh, prevalent in the Roman Empire at that time, especially among the Jews, was they would take a slave and they would wash the slave and make him into a free man. It's a very interesting thing what they did there. They they would wash the slave, and as they were washing the slave, they would audibly pronounce a name over the slave as they were washing him or her, whatever the case may be. The name was very important. It had to be the name of a free man. If it was the name of a free man, when they were washing the slave, from that point onward, he was no longer a slave, but he was a free man. I got to thinking of that in relationship to baptism. 
There's only one who ever lived and breathed and walked on the face of this earth. The Bible said he was tempted in all points, like as we are, yet without sin. When it comes to sin, he's the only free man that ever lived. And I believe that when we are washed, when we are baptized, and the name of the free man is audibly pronounced over us, from that point onward, we no longer have to be slaves to sin because we have the name of the free man applied to our lives. And there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Aren't you thankful for the saving name of the Lord Jesus Christ? What a lovely name. What a powerful name. His name is above every name. <laughs> he is over all principality and power. He's over the rules of darkness. He, he's on our side. We've got so much working for us. Why do we so much out of the time focus on what's working against us? If God be for us, who can be against us? We need to have faith. We need, uh, he's not coming back for a defeated church. He's not coming back for a beaten down church. He's coming back for a victorious church. He's coming back for a triumphant church. Oh, I want to continue to believe in the power of God working in the midst of his church. I want to believe in a great God. I want to really believe he is who he says he is. <laughs> so 3,000 were added. And then the Bible says that the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And I believe he's been doing that now every, every day for the last 2,000 years. And we're a part of the greatest thing to be a part of on the face of this earth. And so we're going to cover 2,000 years this morning. Everybody say thank God for padded chairs. <laughs> of course, we're going to start with the first century. And this next slide uh, shows us that uh, <clears throat> in a recent article in a theological journal called Studia Theologica, I'm sure you've read that journal from time to time, uh, a fellow by the name of Hartman says this about first century baptism. He says, we can be quite certain that this baptism in the first century was given into the name of Jesus. And then in another theological journal article, a fellow by the name of Whitaker talking about second century baptism it says that it appears the formula in ordinary use in the second century must have been I baptize thee in the name of Jesus Christ. Now these two fellows, Hartman and Whitaker, they're not, one is apostolic, they're not biased towards our way of thinking, but yet with all of the available evidence, they have concluded that exclusively the first century church baptized in Jesus' name, and in the second century was the ordinary way the Christians were baptized. You say, what about Matthew 28, 19? We've got no problem with Matthew 28, 19. Jesus said, I've come in my Father's name. The very name Jesus means Jehovah has become our salvation. Isaiah, in describing the son that would be born in Isaiah chapter 9 of his prophecy, refers to him as the everlasting Father. The name of the Son is obviously Jesus, and the name of the Holy Ghost is Jesus. Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you, he said. When we receive the Holy Ghost, the Bible describes it as Christ in us, the hope of glory. The name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is Jesus. And there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. <laughs> when I'm baptized, I want that saving name called over me. I don't want some titles repeated. And there have been people throughout history who have wanted that same thing. This next screen is uh, talks about the, th the third century. I know that's one of the reasons why you didn't like history in school. The 200s of the third century, 300s of the fourth century. It's hard to believe that we are in the 21st century, isn't it? <laughs> but in the third century, we have a statement from a bishop of Rome at that time. You can't get much more Catholic than the bishop of Rome, can you? But uh, he made the statement back, and he said, The name of Christ conduces greatly to faith and to the sanctification of baptism, so that whoever's been baptized anywhere in the name of Christ at once obtains the grace of Christ. Now, certainly if a bishop of Rome is advocating this form of baptism, it must have been a very common practice during that third century. And then we get into the fourth century, and uh, quite an interesting thing is taking place in the Roman Empire. There is a recognition on the part of especially the elite in the empire that the glory that once was Rome was diminishing all around them. 
And so they begin to grasp for straws and they begin to try to come up with some ideas. How can we reverse this trend of deterioration that we see taking place all around us? And they came up with this idea, hey, if we had a one world religion, if we had a universal church, then we would see the glory that once was Rome return. And so one of the fellows that bought into this idea became the emperor. His name was Constantine. He says, that sounds like a good idea. Let's take the good aspects of the various religions around the empire let's mix them together in kind of a witch's brew and let's come up with this key to a reversal of the deterioration that we see taking place all around us so they called a council in the city of nicaea and uh, i'm quoting here from a baptist writer by the name of robert robinson and this of course took place in 325 in the early part of the fourth century and this Baptist writer says this about the Council of Nicaea. He says, all the classes who did not hold the doctrine of a trinity of persons in God, and this idea of God being three persons did not come from the Scripture. It came from Greek philosophy and polytheistic thinking. And they incorporated that into what they called Christianity. But he said, whether these groups were called, and these are just names of groups back then, Artemonites, Polinians, Arians, Monarchians, Patropassians, Sibelians, or by any other name, he said, we're still administering baptism in the name of Christ. And these were the people whom the Council of Nicaea required to be rebaptized in case they came to join the popular party who believed the Trinity of Persons, who called themselves the Orthodox or the right way, and who had managed, being the larger, most complying party of Christians, to get themselves established by the secular power. Now, Robert Robinson, this Baptist historian, is saying here that in 325, there were still many groups throughout the Roman Empire who were still baptizing people the way that the apostles baptized people in the name of Jesus Christ. And even though this effort was being made to get these groups to forsake their doctrine and their teaching, they would not forsake it and join this universal church. They said, we're going to stick with this thing. It doesn't matter what persecution comes. It doesn't matter. I tell you, I believe that there are some people in this world today that if there is a one world church established and we are outcasts from that, we're going to stay outcasts from it. We're going to stay true to the doctrine of Jesus Christ. We're going to stay true to the word of God. I want to stay true to what thus saith the word of the Lord. I want to be obedient to God and not to man. I like to look at it like this. Well, the council's going on, and they talk about the bishops getting in fist fights there. There was a little home missions church down the street. They were baptizing somebody in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Why? Because it didn't matter what was going on in the political world. It didn't matter what was going on in, in, in the cultural world. It didn't matter. God was still building his church because Jesus Christ is the head over all principality and power. He's over the rulers of darkness. He has all power in heaven and on earth. And there's nothing going to stop him from doing what he said he would do. So throughout that century, the fourth century, the effort continued to intensify to establish this universal church. In, uh, and in 380, on this next screen, we have the edict of uh, the emperor at that time, a man by the name of Theodosius. He made an edict back there in 380. Here's a picture of what he looked like back then. And uh, the next screen shows us a qu uh, quoting part of that edict that he made back then. He said, we desire all people whom the benign influence of our clemency rules to turn to the religion. Now, he's lying here. Is it possible for an emperor to lie? Yeah, you're reading it right now. <laughs> to turn to the religion which tradition from Peter the present day declares to have been delivered the Romans by blessed Peter the apostle. Now, we don't know whether Peter ever did go to Rome, but if he would have gone to Rome, he would have preached the same thing in Rome that he preached in Jerusalem. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> but Theodosius, in order to attach apostolic authority to his newly forming religion, tries to identify what he was teaching with the apostles. And so he goes on to say this faith is that there is one Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, equal majesty, and a holy trinity. He goes on to say we order those who follow this doctrine to receive the title of Catholic or universal Christians. But others we judge to be mad and raving. That's us, folks. They're to be punished not only by divine retribution, but also by our own measures, which we have decided 
in accordance with divine inspiration. Now, I'm sure he received divine inspiration from the Prince of Peace to threaten people whose only crime was they didn't want to join his church. Now, if we use that form of evangelism, this place would be packed out today, folks. Just get your gun and go around the town here and invite people to church. I guarantee you they'll come. And if you hold a gun on them, they'll get baptized. I guarantee you they will. <laughs> I'm so glad it's for whosoever will. I'm so glad nobody forced me into this. I'm so glad that God in his mercy led me to the truth, led me to a church that preached this wonderful, glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> but Jesus said very plainly, he said, you'll know them by their fruit. This man, Theodosius, they call him Theodosius the Great. I don't think he was that great. But he ordered his soldiers, he said, go out and kill people who won't join my church. Now, I don't know how you feel about that, but the New Testament does not give us license to kill people. <laughs> Jesus said, do unto others as you have them do to you. Love your enemies. You'll know them by their fruit. This man, Theodosius, claimed to be a Christian emperor, but his actions were not Christian. So you'll know them by their fruit. <laughs> a while back, I was... Uh, one of our pastors in Southern California, in, in Bakersfield, California, was doing a radio program, you know, and, and I was on there for like a week and a half with him. He had the lunch hour there, and it was kind of fun, you know. I tried to be Mr. Nice Guy the first day, and I realized with that talk radio, you've got to be pretty forceful, you know. And I pointed out, hey, listen, all these ones in history who are defending this doctrine that you say is orthodox or the right way, we're killing people. Could it be that there could be something wrong with the doctrine? <laughs> is it possible? You know, oh boy, they, you talk about stirring up some things in Bakersfield there. That was interesting. I had to kind of leave town, kind of like the Apostle Paul left the, the man. No, no, no. <laughs> no, it wasn't that bad. But uh, it's interesting. Now, when Theodosius was emperor, a man by the name of this uh, Priscillian was a bishop in Spain, and uh, he was called to the imperial city of Trier. In this next screen here, uh, this is the what the inside a building that's still standing there in Trier today. You can actually go see this building. Of course, the inside doesn't look like this now, but this man was tried for heresy, and powerful, and actually he and. Uh, Six of his followers. And this is probably where the judgment took place in that building that you saw right there. But this was the first execution for heresy in which the ecclesiastical elementor, in other words, bishops of this newly forming state religion, directly participated. They brought testimony against this man, Priscillian, and he and six of his followers were martyred there in uh, some sources, say 385, some sometimes 6, but it was around that time. Now, Robert Robinson, the famous Baptist historian in this next uh, slide, uh, makes kind of a sarcastic statement. He says, certainly the Priscillians deserve to die for believing that three persons were only one person. This man, Priscillian, who had a tremendous following in Spain, and actually his old Latin Bible was copied by the monasteries, and for hundreds of years it was the predominant Bible in Europe. The Bible that Patrick took to Ireland was copied from Priscillian's Bible. The Wycliffe's English translation was copied from Priscillian's Bible originally. And what's interesting about his Bible is that he had little introductions to the Gospels there that were full of oneness teaching. <laughs> and these Bibles, kind of like Word of Flame Bibles throughout Europe there for hundreds of years. Anyway, in this next screen here, Priscillian is uh, associated with Jesus' name, Baptism and the Oneness of God. He said back then, the Christian faith in Father, Son, and Spirit is belief in one God, Christ. For pursuing the distinction between God and Christ is like the distinction between mind and speech. Now, the reason they killed this man was that they wanted to stop the revival that was going on under his leadership in Spain, as well as in southern France there. And the thing about this is, is you can kill human leaders, but that does not mean that the church is going to stop. That does not mean that the church is going to cease to exist. They killed him and six of his followers, but there was one who appeared to John on the Isle of Patmos. And he said, I was dead, but behold, I'm alive forevermore. He's the head of the church. He's the blessed and only potentate. His name is Jesus Christ. 
He is able to preserve his church. I don't care what comes against it. I don't care how much uh, the devil will uh, send in uh, his imps like a flood. The Lord will raise up a standard against the enemy. So in spite of this man's martyrdom, his followers kept on preaching Jesus' name baptism, kept on preaching the oneness of God for more than 800 years after his death. Why? Because you can't stop the church of the living God. We may not look like we have much political influence. We may not look like we've got a lot of financial power in this world, but we are the most significant entity on the face of this earth. Don't be ashamed you're Pentecostal. <laughs> oh, we are so blessed. We need to be so thankful. What amazes me is, is how, you know, and I'm, a, I'm ashamed of myself when I look back. I could stand up here and boast you, oh, since I've got the Holy Ghost a few years ago when I was a teenager, since I've got that, I've, I've prayed for thousands of hours, and I can honestly say that. But, you know, when I look at the percentage of the time I called prayer, and realize how it was just complaining. <laughs> it's embarrassing. We know how to complain to God more than we know how to worship God. I wish I could somehow wave a magic wand and change all that complaining into praising the one who is altogether lovely, the one who deserves all our praise, who deserves all the glory. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. He's worthy of our praise today. He's worthy to be exalted. He's worthy to be lifted up. Praise God. Now, around the year 500, the historians say that the Western Europe went into what they call the Dark Ages. People say, how could God have a church during the Dark Ages? The sun didn't even come up. Yeah, the sun did come up, folks. And those ages weren't as dark as they make it out to be. But, you know, people say, well, the barbarians invaded. You know, God can't have a church with all that confusion going on. Listen, folks, look around you today. <laughs> There's more confusion going on than there ever was in the world and God still has a church. Sin is abounding on every hand, but where sin abounds, grace doth that much more abound. <clears throat> and so it should not surprise us that we see a bishop of Rome by the name of Pelagius I during the so-called Dark Ages making a statement like this. He said, there are many, everybody say many, who assert that they are baptized in the name of Christ alone with only one immersion. I wonder where these people came from. <laughs> The pagan emperors couldn't stop it. The so-called Christian emperors couldn't stop it. The barbarian invasions could not stop the church of the living God. It was still there. They were still baptizing people in Jesus' name. The Lord was still adding to the church daily such as should be saved. Now this man Pelagius goes on to say that people should be baptized in the titles. He was the first bishop of Roman to come out against Jesus' name, baptism. But when he came out against it, he admitted that there were still many getting baptized the original apostolic way in the name of Jesus Christ. Now we're going to look at the country of Spain, and we're going to look at it over like an 1,100-year period. This first period of time we're looking at is from approximately 407 to 713. I'm quoting from Robert Robinson, the Baptist historian, who says this. He says the chief article of discussion in Spain during that time. Now, this guy was an interesting guy. He was a very prominent Baptist preacher in England. And uh, his fellow Baptist ministers pulled together sums of money so that he could go down to London to study history. And he w had access to books that are probably lost today. He taught himself the old Spanish, so he knew what he was talking about here. And he's saying that uh, in these books he found out that the chief article of discussion in Spain was baptism from approximately 400 to 700. He said the Arian Goths, the Priscillianists, remember just mentioned Priscillian who was martyred in 385, the followers of Bonosius and others deemed heretics by the Catholics, he said, were literally Anabaptists or rebaptizers in regard to the Catholics. Themselves were baptized once only by dipping in the name of Christ. But when Catholics who've been dipped in the name of the Trinity joined their churches, they re-dipped them. <laughs> This is kind of like what happened to me when I was a baby. The Catholic priest sprinkled some water on my forehead. It's in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then when I was a teenager, a few years ago, I came into the church there in St. Paul, Minnesota. 
and got rebaptized by Rudy Bo in the name of Jesus. Is he still alive? I heard he got remarried, but he, he's still alive, I think. Rudy Bo, yeah. <laughs> I'll never forget that because the first time I came to church, I looked up at the platform there, and I saw this preacher up there. I saw Rudy Bo sitting on the platform. I said, and the devil talked to me, and he said, that guy looks like a used car salesman. I hope we don't have any used car salesmen here today. But, <laughs> but you, know, you know, the devil's a liar. Rudy Bo is a great guy. <laughs> Yeah, he did. He, yeah, I heard that. Yeah, it's wonderful. <clears throat> anyway, and then the next uh, period of time we're going to look at here uh, in the history of Spain is from approximately 700 to about 1500 when the Mohammedans were in Spain. The Moors ruled Spain for much of that time, and uh, really Cordoba in Spain was the New York City of the world during that time. Very advanced area under Moorish rule, and they were not as in intolerant as they are today we think of muslims today as being very intolerant but back then they weren't very intolerant and they allowed christian groups to exist and thrive where they ruled and of course one of those places was in spain and this next screen here tells us about these different groups that were there in spain uh these are just names of groups i don't even know if i'm pronouncing these words right but it says manicheans arians priscillianus donatus sabellans fatinians and monosians pretty good huh Bounded in all that part of Spain, which was governed by the Mohammedans, but there were no heretics in those states because the law created no such crime as heresy. He goes on to say that the uh, Catholic bishops, he said in the next screen, uh, agreed that such as came from anti Trinitarians who'd been baptized only in the name of Christ should be rebaptized. So, according to this Baptist historian Robert Robinson, from 400 to 1500, there was an apostolic presence in the nation of Spain for all those years. People were getting baptized in Jesus' name. I believe well before the year 400, there was an apostolic church in Spain. Paul, in one of his epistles, mentions his desire to go to Spain. We don't know whether he actually did go to Spain or not. But I believe that shortly after the day of Pentecost, there were some who went back and began to establish churches in that nation. Now, an unfortunate thing happened in the nation of Spain. The... Uh, what they call the Reconquista took place, and the original inhabitants of Spain began to push Moorish rule back down in the northern Africa. And uh, you've heard of Ferdinand Isabella. You've heard of Christopher Columbus, 1492, Columbus sailed the blue and all that kind of stuff. Well, around the year 1500, they consolidated their power there, and they established a state church, the Catholic Church, and they begin to institute something that is notorious in the history of mankind called the Spanish Inquisition. The whole purpose of the Spanish Inquisition was to make everybody in Spain good Roman Catholics. The methodology wasn't exactly Christian. Again, I'd like to remind you, Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruit. They would take these poor people to torture chambers and some of the most diabolical tortures that have ever been conceived in the deprived mind of man took place. And then they'd take them out to a city square and have what they call an auto affair, an act of faith, where they'd burn people at the stake. Now, I believe the vast majority of the apostolic people left the country of Spain during that terrible time. But I believe that at least some of those people who were tortured and killed were Jesus' name people who would not compromise what God had done for them. I tell you, we are so blessed to live in a country. And I, and I believe the most important words... In any government document in this country, as the words that you find in the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States, which guarantees us freedom of religion. And I believe the blessing of God is upon this country because of those words. Because we are children of Abraham by faith, and I believe the promises that apply to Abraham apply to the church. Those who bless us, God's going to bless. Those who curse us, God's going to curse. And it's interesting, when you look at Spain, uh, the Spanish Inquisition, of course, brought religious liberty to a standstill in Spain. As I said, many of these apostolic, along with multiplied thousands of Jews during that terrible time, left the nation of Spain. And you see, after they took away religious freedom, how that God's blessings lifted from that country. And especially after the defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588, Spain became a second-rate nation. And they really haven't done much since... Just recently, they did allow religious freedom, and we're starting to see a little revival going on over in Spain right now. Uh, not as much as we'd like to see, but uh, 
God is renewing his blessings on that country because of religious freedom. You just can't take away freedom from the church and expect the blessings of God. Now, uh, a lot of these people uh, migrate there around uh, Holland, and then and then in Poland during the sixteen uh, the fifteen hundreds actually, and into the sixteen hundreds, there was quite a bit of freedom there in Poland, and we uh, find a man by the name of George Shulman who was a leader of the Polish Brethren, wrote in his diary, he said, On the last day of August, 1572, I being in the 42nd year of my age, was baptized in the name of Christ at Chmielnik. Now, this showman represented a group that the Harvard scholar, Dr. George Hunston Williams, now, it's interesting, this Dr. Williams, do they know who Denver Stanford is? Yeah, he's been here. Uh, when he was pastoring in Boston, Massachusetts, he visited with Dr. Williams in his office at Harvard, and actually prayed Dr. Williams through the Holy Ghost a few years back. And Dr. Williams has done extensive study on what he calls the Polish Reformation. And in this study, he has found these Jesus-named people that were there, and he calls them fully restorationist brethren. The reason he says that is they fully restored the apostolic practice of Jesus' name baptism. They continued to baptize in Jesus' name in Poland until the middle 1600s. An unfortunate thing happened in Poland they took away religious freedom. And when you look at the history of the nation of Poland, you see terrible atrocities come after they took away religious freedom. In the middle 1600s, the bubonic plague hit. Neighboring countries invaded. Uh, the Encyclopedia Britannica tells us that over half the population was destroyed in a very short time after they took away religious freedom. Thank God for religious freedom. A lot of those people migrated around the area around Amsterdam. Their influence jumped up into England. In England, in the middle 1600s, a great revival was taking place. And this next screen here is a picture of a church. And this church is in a little town called Marden, which is in the county of Kent in England, just southeast of the city of London. And a fellow by the name of Francis Cornwell was pastoring in this church back in the 1600s. In the next screen, uh, I was able to go inside the church, and here's the baptismal font that's in the building there now. But they had a little booklet telling about the history of the building, and in that booklet, they mentioned how this is not the original baptismal font that was in there. This is the one that replaced the original one. And what happened was Cornwell saw baptism by immersion in the name of Jesus Christ, and he said, listen, fellas, we don't need this bird bath inside the house of God. Let's get rid of it. And so the one that you see here in the picture is the one that replaced the one that he had torn out. He saw baptism by immersion in the name of Jesus Christ. And so they got rid of their baptismal font inside that building and began to baptize people the original apostolic way by immersion in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, he wrote many things, and this next uh, screen will tell us. Uh, he wrote uh, something that was directed to a Church of England minister by the name of Whittle, and he says this, and of course I'm spelling exactly the way he spelled it. They didn't have dictionaries back then. He says, Moreover, M. Whittle, you and your brethren deny Jesus Christ to be our anointed king and that you yield not obedience to his gospel commandment, namely repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, Acts 2.38. Now this fellow was a Baptist and he was preaching Acts 2.38 back then, and he's accusing Whittle of denying Jesus Christ as his anointed king. Now, this is an interesting time in the, in the history of England because they were, during this time, the English Civil War was going on, and they rebelled against their earthly king, Charles I. And if you study a little bit of the history of England, they were successful in their rebellion against Charles I. They even had his head chopped off. But Cornwell is saying you might be successful in rebelling against your earthly king, but you're not going to be successful in rebelling against the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Because if you don't obey Acts 2.38, you're rebelling against Jesus Christ. Now, Whittle responds here. He says, you fly upon us for denying Christ's spirit, anointed king, and so for open rebellion against him. And all because we will not be dipped. <laughs> He says, we acknowledge but one baptism in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, with, with which we have been already baptized in our infancy. But, Whittle, you need to give up the traditions of men, and you need to obey the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Cornwell, 
<coughs> wrote something else called Two Questions Worthy of Serious Consideration Concerning the Gospel Faith of Our Lord Jesus Christ Once Delivered on the Saints. And that was just part of the title. They liked long titles back then. But the two questions were essentially these two questions. Question number one, what is the everlasting gospel that Jesus commanded his disciples to preach to all nations beginning at Jerusalem? These questions were directed to Church of England ministers at that time. And question number two is whether they, Church of England ministers at that time, preach now the everlasting gospel in the same manner to them that inquire after it as Peter did to the trembling Jews. <laughs> Acts 2.38 now, in that church that you saw there, they were worshiping Pentecostal style because in this next screen here, we see how that he wrote against, he said, I cannot worship God in a stinted, and this is an old English term that means restricted form of worship in prayer and in praise. So they were worshiping Pentecostal style back there in the middle 1600s. And then in the 1700s, many of the Baptists adopted Jesus name baptism and one of the prominent Baptists in the late 1700s in England was a man by the name of William Richards and he says this about he says that it represents the believer our subject as assuming a new name even that of Christ or a Christian hence the converts were baptized in or into the name of our Lord Jesus and are said to put on Christ in this ordinance this man was one of many Baptist preachers in England in the 1700s and the 1800s who were baptizing people in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. 